Welcome to episode 365 of the AMPM podcast. My guest this week is none other than the famous Perry Belcher. If you don't know who Perry is, Perry is one of the top internet marketers, probably one of the top copywriters in the world today. He's got his hands in all kinds of stuff from newsletters to AI to print on demand to funnels to you name it in marketing. Perry's either got tremendous amount of experience in it or he's heavily involved in it right now. We talk some shop today and just uh, go kind of all over the place on some really cool, interesting topics. I think you're going to get a lot from this episode, so I hope you enjoy it. And don't forget, if you haven't yet, be sure to sign up for the Billion Dollar Sellers newsletter. It's at billiondollarsellers, with an S, dot com. It's totally free. New issue every Monday and Thursday. It's getting rave reviews from people in the industry and some of the, the top people in the industry as well as people just getting started. So uh, it's got a little bit different take on it and uh, just a lot of information. Plus, we have a little bit of fun as well in the newsletter. So hopefully you can join us at BillionDollarSellers.com. Enjoy today's episode with Perry. Welcome to the AMPM Podcast. Welcome to the AMPM Podcast. We explore opportunities in e-commerce. We dream big and we discover what's working right now. Plus, plus, this is the podcast where money never sleeps. Working around the clock in the AM and the PM. Are you ready for today's episode? I said, I said are, are you, you ready? Ready. Let's do this. Let's do this. Here's your host, Here's your host. Kevin King. Kevin King. Perry Belcher, welcome to the AM PM podcast. It's an honor to have you on here. How's it going, man? Dr. King Esquire at all. <laughs> I'm doing great, buddy. I'm doing great. I'm just uh, trying to survive this hot, hot, hot summer that we're all having, you know. But well, you got, you're out there. You're out there in Vegas. Y'all had uh, y'all had floods, right? I, I was seeing uh, some stuff on TikTok, like some of the casino yeah. garages and stuff are flooding. Yeah, there were there were some floods out here. So it's it's been uh we got like a year's worth of rain in two days or something like that, they said, which we could stand. It didn't hurt, but uh the hot weather out here is just the way that it is. You get used to it after a little a little while. Yeah, it's the same in Austin. It's like a hundred and eight, I think, uh today. Uh and I know uh yeah. you know, fo- football season just recently started. And everybody's complaining that uh, they're doing a game and the uh, one of the first games was in the middle of the afternoon, like two thirty in the afternoon. And like, man, half these people are going to be dying out there. You better have some yeah. extra medical, you know, supposed to do these things at night in Texas uh, during September. Yeah. Not, not, My not kid in the played of the day. football in Texas and he, he had some days that there were kids passing out, you know, so I don't miss, I don't miss the heat in Austin. I'll take the heat in Vegas instead. It's different kind of heat to me. Yeah, it's not. It's a more of a dry heat. Not that not not that yeah. humid, humid heat that we have here. I'll take it. <clears throat> So uh, for those, there's some probably some people listening that don't know. They're like, "Who's this Perry Belcher character?" I never heard of this Perry Belcher guy. And it, if if you haven't, you've probably been living on a rock in internet marketing because Perry Belcher is one of the living legends out there. And when it comes to internet marketing, it's not just you know, he dabbles on Amazon, but it's Amazon's just a little piece of what he does. He does a ton of other stuff. So, uh, and you've been doing this since you're like you've been an entrepreneur since you're like I don't know three years old. I, I heard you selling hot dogs, and I mean you've pretty much done everything from running. From selling hot dogs to running, uh, I don't know, jewelry repair shops or something to having little kiosk in the mall to crazy, cr- crazy kind of stuff. I mean, just for those that don't know who the heck you are, just uh, give a little bit about your background. I started out, you know, I, I grew up really poor in a little town in Kentucky, Paducah. It's the sound a dead body makes when it hits the floor. And uh, I'll, I, as soon as I could, I stayed there until I could drive. As soon as I could drive a car, I got the heck out of there and went to the big city, Nashville, you know. And, um, I, I got into, you know, early on, I got into retail and I owned uh, 42 jewelry stores at one time when I was really, really young. Before I was old enough to buy a beer, I owned 42 jewelry stores. Isn't that crazy? Not that I didn't buy beer, but a lot of that was legally. Buy beer, <laughs> yeah, exactly. Right? Um, you know, so I was in retail. Um, I went out of, uh, you know, eventually I made three different runs in retail. I did okay. And then uh, I got into manufacturing and I found I really enjoyed manufacturing a great deal. I still do a lot of manufacturing, as you know. And then um, <clears throat> and then along, um, I guess, about 1997, uh, for those young whippersnappers that were born about then that are on in your Amazon crowd, right? 
1997, they, they invented this thing called the interwebs and Jeff Bezos started a store called Amazon. And I sort of got, um, I sort of got all caught up in the, the web thing. And, uh, you probably don't know this story. It was a true story, Kevin. I got a call from Jeff Bezos when I owned craftstore.com. So this was in probably 1998 or 1999. I got a personal call from Jeff Bezos um, wanting to talk to me about buying craftstore.com and rolling it into the Amazon family. And then they were only selling books. They were bleeding. I don't even know, a hundred million dollars a quarter or some crazy number. And I'm like, dude, you're, I'm reading about you. You're losing money. <laughs> I'm making money. You know, hey, I think you got this reversed. I probably should buy you. I swear to God, I said that. I said that. Uh, that was about best I can figure about a seven hundred and fifty million dollar mistake. Well, it's funny you say that because I mean we go back. We're we're old school when it comes to to way before you know all this internet marketing craze. We were doing old school marketing, you know, by by po putting a postage stamp on an envelope and sending it out. And and I remember I have a couple similar stories back around that same time, uh, early late nineties, early two thousands. Uh, the guy, MySpace had just started somewhere around in, in there. Um, and those mm -hmm. guys reached out to me. I had a, I had a newsletter, an online newsletter going at the time. And they reached out to me to do something. And I turned, I, I just ignored them. I was like, what's this MySpace thing? I never heard of it. I did the same thing with Jim Barksdale. You know who that was? Yeah. Barksdale wanted to buy one of my companies and I blew him off. And he was Netscape. You know, I right? also used to do uh, back, you might remember this back. Uh, I had several different websites and to get traffic back before there was Google and all these you know, this uh, SEO and all this stuff, you, it's basically it's Alta Vista and, uh, you know, mm, I love that Yahoo and all these guys. And you could just just by putting stuff in the meta tags, you, you rank, you know, on the top You'd of spam the crap out of you. Yeah. The crap out of you. <laughs> You're putting text down at the bottom and making it oh, the good, oh, and, the good and old all that kind of stuff. But I, I one of the things you might remember this, there's what's called ring sites. So in order to get traffic, you go to some guy would figure out how to get people to his site and then down oh, the bottom, circle, it would be right? like next or previous. And you, you, you'd hit a button and it'd go to the next, the previous Well, we, we had a newsletter that was doing about 250,000 emails a day back before can spam and all that stuff. And to get traffic to it, you know, we were getting on Howard mm -hmm. Stern show when he was on terrestrial radio and we were doing all kinds of crazy stuff. But I was working with a site called BOMIS, B O M I S. And they had one of these ring sites and we, they were like one of our top sources of traffic. And I just remember uh, there's two guys there running out of their apartment or something. And I, I talked to one of them. Uh, this is like probably around 2000 or so ish, 2001. And he said, Hey, uh, you're going to be dealing with me from now on. My, my buddy is moving on. Uh, I'm like, all right. I said, James is moving on. I was like, okay, cool. And what, what's he going to do? He's like, I don't know, some sort of encyclopedia or something. Uh, I'm not sure what he's going to do. He's got some, some crazy idea. Turns out it was Jimmy Wells from Wikipedia. So I was actually working with Jimmy Wells from Wikipedia before he was Jimmy Wells from Wikipedia. Isn't that crazy? It's, it's crazy. I mean, the stories that we can tell from the early days of the internet are, are oh my gosh. I, when crazy. I look back, I just can't, you know, my, my buddy's favorite saying, and I've adopted this. I can't believe how stupid I was two weeks ago. You know, it's like, you just, you just realize, you know, just the boneheaded stuff that you did when there was so much opportunity. The first domain I ever bought, this was like, just when domain registrations came out, I bought formulas, the number four, you.com. The most worthless domain anyone could ever own when I could have probably bought internet.com for $10. Yeah. <laughs> like you, just, you just could buy anything and I bought the most boneheaded stuff, you know? Well, you remember the, the guy that he got in early, he bought, was it sex.com or something for like, you know, 10 bucks or whatever it cost to register it back then before there was a GoDaddy. Yeah. And you know, the, remember the fight like 20 years ago over that domain because it became like the most valuable domain on the entire internet or something. Remember that, right. that huge fight about, about that? Uh, it was, it was crazy. I know. But I, I know there's been a bunch of those stories, man. I've got some friends that really did well buying domain real estate early on. I bought a lot. I mean, I've over time, I still think domains are a bargain. I really do. Most for the most part. I own stuff like sewing.com and makeuptutorials.com and DIYprojects.com. I, own, I still own some big stuff that we operate and, uh, and I own a bunch of other big stuff that we don't, op don't operate. And, um, you know, I'm, I'm buying aftermarkets now. I bought conventions.com for 
a little over four hundred thousand um, dollars two weeks before COVID. Was was boy that timing was extraordinary. You know what what could go wrong? Conventions were impervious to depression, and um, so anyway, yeah. And so so I started buying. You know, I I, I got to manufacturing, and I immediately saw the benefit of uh, online selling because you could cut out all the different layers of middlemen in the, in the, between the consumer and the manufacturer. So I've been a manufacturer selling direct to consumer for a long time. And then I got, I got in business with uh, uh, Ryan Dice after I got in a lot of trouble, almost went to jail in the supplement business scares me to death to this day. You know um, I lost everything I had almost went to the clink and, and uh, uh, when that all got settled out, I went to business with Ryan Dice and um, we, he turned me on really to the information selling world. How did you and guys? How did you guys meet up? Was it at some event, or did you just meet up? Yeah, we uh, met up. Um, yeah, I'll tell you the story. It's a pretty funny story. So uh, we met at a Yonic Silver event. We went to a dinner with you know all these millionaires, you know, in the room, the the millionaire mastermind people, and we went to this big dinner, and we had like twenty people at the dinner, and when the check came, it was like, well, I only had a salad. Well, I only had the soup, and you know, they're all dividing up checks and crap, and I'm like, come on. And Ryan looked at me and I looked at him. He said, do you just want to pay this bill and get the hell out of here? And I said, yeah. So we split the bill and uh, that's how we became friends, how we met. And then, um, um, you know, when I, we knew each other through Yannick. And then when I got in trouble in the supplement business, um, I mean, I had loads of friends when you're, when you're netting out um, half a million dollars a month and you're flying all your friends on private jets, to the Bahamas and crap on the weekends, boy, you got lots of friends, you know? And as soon as the money ran out, well, guess what? The friends ran out, you know, <laughs> and, you know, everything was, you know, nobody knew who I was then, you know, and uh, Ryan called me and said, Hey man, I got this business in Austin. It's doing a couple million dollars a year. If you'll come uh, help me run it, I'll give you half of it. And we did $9 million in the first seven months. That's correct. Yeah. It was called touch tone publishing then. But it eventually we rebranded it, became digital marketer. And then out of digital marketer came traffic and conversion summit and out of traffic and conversion summit came the war room mastermind. And we ran all three of those for years. And, um, uh, we sold digital, we sold a TNC to, uh, Clarion Blackstone, uh, Blackstone group, um, about four years ago, I guess. And then we, uh, um, then I sold my interest in digital marketer, um, to Ryan and uh, Ryan Roland Richard about uh, two years ago. And then we dissolved War Room um, about a year ago, I guess. They were going a different direction. And uh, um, Qasem Islam and uh, Jason Flavel and I started Driven Mastermind. So, um, but yeah, it was a great, great run with those guys. They're super good guys. They're super, super smart. And uh, uh, we, we were business partners for uh, 14 years, long time. It's a long, that's a, you know, it's lasted that's out a last long time. Long that's a long time in this business. That's a longer than all my marriages <laughs> you know, almost combined, you know? <laughs> uh, so, so going just down, we'll talk about some of those in just a second, but just down that back, what, what got you in trouble in the supplement business? Was it claims that you just didn't realize you couldn't be making? Yeah, or what was, what was the, uh, it was kind of a combination. I, I was, I was legitimately a pharmaceutical manufacturer. We were an FDA pharmaceutical manufacturer. I got all the licensure and all that. I got in trouble with the state. <clears throat> it had nothing to do with the federal. They called in federal. They called in DEA. They called in everybody. And they're like, no, nah, guys, everything he's doing is is correct. Um, but the state took issue to some claims. And what ended up happening, um, they realized that they, they had not – you know, the thing is, once the state gets their tentacles into you and have your money, you know, it's really hard for you to get rid of them, right? They're like a tick. Uh, but uh, at the end of the day, the only thing that 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 they actually that stuck was something called ways and measures. So that meant that my equipment wasn't precise enough to put the exact amount of um, product per bottle. So, so let's say it says it's two ounces, right? Mine might be 2.1 or 1.9 ounces, right? And that's there's there are state laws about that. They're called ways and measures laws. They're governed by the people who manage gas pumps. 
if you can believe it. But out of everything that they originally said that I was doing, they dropped everything else. And that was the only thing that actually at the end of the day was it. But I had to settle it. And um, they got all my money and all my stuff and left me $3 million in debt. And when uh, I went to Austin and we hustled hard, you know, for a couple of years and I paid all that off, I didn't file bankruptcy on it. And it was hilarious because uh, I threw a Perry's broke party. So about two years in, when I got to zero, I got back to just broke. I wasn't $3 million upside <laughs> down, right? I threw a giant Perry's broke party. And it's maybe one of the most fun parties we've ever had. It was, it was you were like, in Austin. Did you do that out at, uh, at Willie Nelson's uh, ranch? Because Willie no, Nelson did that IRS no. tapes. Remember, he did that when he got yeah. in trouble for $7 million bucks, And he, he threw yeah. some sort of big-ass fundraising party out. He has this like uh, old uh, ranch out west of Texas, uh, west of Austin. Yeah. That's uh, It's got a studio lot on it, basically an old. Yeah, old I, country I had a big house then. Yeah. And, uh, I just had everybody over the house and we had a big pool party. And oh, my Lord, so many drunk people. <laughs> <laughs> but it was a lot of fun. It was, it was good times. So I got a lot of friends in Austin. And then y'all took Digital Marketer, uh, the, the conference from like, I think the first one was a few hundred people to what the now it's five, 6,000 people uh, or something like yeah, that. Yeah, we like hit the, the biggest internet mar- for If you're in internet marketing or yeah. just in, in general, it's not just Amazon. It's like across the board. Uh, it, it's the biggest one out there, I think. Yeah, before the year before COVID, I think we uh, had the biggest year was 7,200. 7,200 or 7,800, I can't remember. They thought we were going to 10,000 the next year and they rented the Coliseum in um, San Diego instead of the hotels. And then, of course... COVID and it was just a, you know, two or three years. We had sold just prior to that. So had we not have sold uh, that first year of COVID, I think was probably around a $5 million loss, but they had uh, um, Clarion had insurance for it, fortunately. So I don't think they, I don't, I don't know the exact damage, but I know it would have probably wiped us out. Had we been, Cause we had to refund tickets. We had to, uh, you know, the venue wouldn't let us off the hook and oh, I was a big bunch of crap. When it comes to running conferences, I mean, I do my billion dollar seller summit. You do your <laughs> events now. Like you do, you've done the AI, a couple AI summits. You've done, uh, uh, the Perry's weird event or whatever. You do quite a few different <laughs> things. You, you have the, uh, the, the weirdest the, event ever, weirdest yeah. event ever, whatever you've done, like three of those, which are, are yeah. fascinating. Uh, and you do, you know, you have the driven mastermind and you were involved with digital marketer. In our space, there's a ton of people. It's almost gotten flooded with like am- events for Amazon sellers. Like every everybody and their dog wants to have an event, and the vast majority of them suck. There's like seven people there. They can't sell tickets. They're they're losing their shirt. Uh, very few of them actually make money. What is the key, actually, if you want to do an event or you're thinking about that, to actually making these things work? Is it the long term play? You got to have the upsell. Is it the uh, well, what, events what, what, are, events are a very, uh, very much an uphill battle. That's the reason when you go to sell one, they have a lot of value. If you go to, if you, if you build an event to a thousand, 2000 people, it has a lot of value in the exit market because once an event hits a certain, um, uh, inflection point, they're insanely profitable. So you're, so like digital marker, we lost money on TNC for probably the first four years that we did it. But the way we made up for it, we filmed all of the sessions and we sold them as individual products. So we built all of our, we had a thing that really made that thing magical because every session had to be good enough to sell as a product. So it made the event itself, you know, great because you had to have executable, do this, do this, do this, do this. It couldn't just be a fluffy talk, right? So every talk had to be good enough to sell as a product when Ryan and I were doing them. So for the first three or four years, we didn't make hardly any money, but we generated a lot of product out of there that we sold throughout the year. So we, you know, we did make money a couple million dollars a year um, from the product sales. And then over time, uh, the, as the attendance goes up, the ticket prices tend to go up. You start at really low ticket prices and then you ratchet ticket prices up as the event gets bigger and bigger and bigger. And, uh, and it, you start taking on sponsors and we basically got to the point, um, <clears throat> by the time that we sold, uh, you don't really want to sell, right? Cause, uh, 
the sponsors were paying for 80, 90% of the cost to put on the event. Um, tickets were you then over a thousand dollars a ticket. We were selling 7,000 tickets. You didn't really need to sell, you know, because you, the event was paid for by the sponsors. The ticket sales money was just free money. And then whatever you do at the event, you know, in sales is even more free money. But when you look at companies like Clarion that buy these things, they don't care about the product creation. They don't care about selling at the event. They only care about um, tickets um, and they make a lot of money on hotel rooms. So they, so in, when, when they're promoting, they got a lot of cash. So they'll buy all the hotel rooms in downtown San Diego a year before we, right before we, we announced the dates, they buy all the rooms. And then when you're buying your room from booking.com or American express or whatever, um, you're actually buying that ticket from Clarion because Clarion in a lot of cases bought all the rooms in the city for $120 a night. And then a year later, you're paying 350 on Amex and they just pay Amex a commission, a 20% commission. So that's different so, than the way when I do like for a billion dollar seller summit, in order to not have to pay, you know, $3,000 to turn the internet on in the ballroom or to have to uh, per day or from not having to pay for the ballrooms or this or that, we have to do guarantees rather than buying the rooms up front. We have to guarantee that we're going to put 50 butts in the, uh, in these beds <clears> or whatever. Yeah. And if we don't, we get penalized, you know? Um, yeah, right. And so we it's, did, we it's did a different model. Yeah, we did. We did too. You still have room blocks, you know, and, uh, the killer in the killer in the convention business is contract negotiation and room blocks. You know, if you can get room blocks down, there's ways to get around room blocks. Like and if you do, commitments and like minimum, uh, bu- you know, uh, banquet yeah. commitments and stuff. If you do an, a, if you do a, uh, like we did, um, uh, we did one recently at the Aria, and I didn't have a room block anywhere because the Aria is surrounded by like eight hotels within walking distance, so there's no reason to book a room block. Um, everybody could just stay where they wanted within that complex. And then we got together and it, it didn't, it didn't create the problem, but you know, they get you with, they charge you more for F and B. So they, they're going to get you. Right. So I've got my own event center now. Um, I've got a 50 person event center. I think we're going to expand to a hundred people. And, um, and I really prefer having smaller workshops anyway. They're, they're, uh, they're more intimate. They're, they're more effective. Um, and if you're going to sell something else to the, the attendees, uh, the smaller the room, the higher your conversion rates will always be if you're offering something to the attendees. Yeah, that's true. That's yeah. true. So then you took it from there to the mastermind. Y'all did the war room for a long time. And I know my buddies, Manny and Guillermo at Helium 10, um, they joined the war room about two years into working on Helium 10. They said that was the number one life-changing thing that they did. Yeah. From the they people, killed it too. The they people, had a big exit. I don't know the numbers, but I know it's, uh, I see what he's spending and what he's doing. So I'm like, it's, it's some serious numbers, <laughs> but they, they attribute that to war room. Cause there was some, y'all did one event and I think it was in Austin actually around 2018 ish. And it was all about system, uh, whatever the talk was on that one. Cause they're quarterly, they were quarterly deals. I think it was all about systemizing and getting out of your way and like cutting all the riff. Right. I don't, I, but they said that was, it was, game changing for them and, and, and made them tens of millions of dollars. So, but to join, you know, a war room was what 30 grand. I know driven was what you have now, which I've been to driven's 30 grand. Yeah. I've been to, I've been to driven. Uh, I went to the one back in uh, July, uh, which was, was excellent out in, in LA. Uh, and, yeah. and I love going to these, those, those of you that are listening, you know, this is not an Amazon conference. A lot of us go to Amazon conferences, but I think the best conferences for me are actually the non Amazon conferences because I go into something like a driven where there's, yeah, there's, a handful of Amazon people there, but there's also a bunch of Facebook people. There's also a bunch of domain people. There's SEO people. There's people that, you know, just have some sort of a shop uh, in Baltimore that, you know, do internet marketing and you, you meet this range of people. And for me, it's brainstorming sessions. I, I, I'm uninterrupted. You know, if, if I'm watching stuff online, even the recording of that, you know, I got phone calls coming in, the dog's barking, you know, wife's nagging, whatever it may be, you're interrupted, but you're sitting in a room from nine to five. He's obviously not in the room. Yeah, you're sitting in yeah, you're sitting in a room, <laughs> sitting in a room <laughs> from nine to five, listening to people these people talk, and a lot of it you might already know. Some of it may be new to you, um, but you're just sitting there. One guy says something, Perry says something, and then 
Chasm says something, and then Jason says something, and whoever else uh, the speaker is says something, you start going, man, if I put all these things together uh, and I can do this for my business, holy shit, um, this is freaking incredible. Uh, and so that's, these people look at, man, why the heck would I pay 25 or 30 grand to be in some sort of event? And if in the Amazon space, I personally wouldn't because I'm going to be the one delivering most of the value in a lot of cases. And so why would I pay to join something? They should be paying me to come to it. But when you go to something where it's a cross section of people in the marketing world that all think like you, but they do different things. I think that's the most valuable thing. Would you, would you agree? I think honestly, I think in a, in a good mastermind and that there's that good being in parentheses and a good mastermind, I don't think you can lose money. I, I, I think it's almost impossible. I've made money in every mastermind I've ever been in. You, you just, I, I like the idea of di the diversity, right? I might learn something from a guy in the funeral industry that can be applied to somebody that's selling weight loss, right? Uh, you, you never know. And, you know, my benefit, I guess, I've been around a long time like you, Kevin. I've been around the, the block a bunch. And, uh, you know, I've been fortunate enough to work with like hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of businesses pretty intimately in the in the, the war room and now driven setting. And, you know, I get to see what's working and what's not working from like a 10,000 foot view inside all these businesses. So for me, it, personally, it's a great benefit that I get to learn something from really diverse. You know, I, I learned the other day I was talking to a friend of mine, that, um, a client that that they're in the uh, uh, they sell online. You book an appointment, you know, they call you and whatever. And they're in an industry that I have no interest in no knowledge of right but they figured out that if they once somebody's booked an appointment if they put a zoom a live zoom on the thank you page with somebody sitting there going hey kevin so glad you booked your appointment by the way jimmy can take you right now if you want right that one thing those those people that are coming in that way are converting nine times higher than the people who book a normal sales call and the beautiful thing now is you can do that with AI. There's tools with AI yeah. where you could actually, when they fill in that form, <clears throat> I'm, I'm registered, I'm Kevin. They're like air.ai and all that. Yeah, yeah, several of them when you could actually, and you could put in, you upload a spreadsheet or tie it into, you know, through an API to your your cell system that Jenny's available. And it can actually, as, as I'm typing in Kevin King, it's in the background recording a video with, with Perry saying, hey, hi, Kevin. Uh, this is Perry. I'm glad you just signed up. Uh, yep. Jenny's available right now. It's all automated and all like, like, holy cow, how the hell Perry's just sitting around and, you know, the conversions on that go through the roof. Oh, they're nutty. And, but that's something I learned from a person who's in the, like the, the trauma, they, they serve trauma psychiatrists. That's their market. And I'm like, I would never know that in a million years. Right. But, but how many other businesses or clients of mine could that one tactic be applicable to? The answer is a lot. Right. So you, so when you go into those rooms where, you know, to be in driven, you got to be doing at least a million a year. But I think our average is around seven million a year gross, um, <clears throat> and uh, and some you know up to you know there's there's some hundred million dollar uh, yeah, there's folks. some big players in there. There's some big players in there, but you but nobody's stupid, right? <laughs> you're you're in a room full of really really smart people where they're basically telling you what they're doing. I, you know, I joke about it. I get paid for people to tell me, I get paid for really smart people to tell me what they're doing that's really working and what ain't, right? What a gig, what a great gig I got, right? But um, but yeah, we've been doing it for a really long time. They're, those groups, masterminds are hard to keep together and keep happy and all that. They're Because they are, because they're intimate, uh, people share a lot of, details and sometimes you have personality kind of little things it's crazy nutty stuff that happens that you it, the only problem with those things are just they're they're a bit to they're a bit to manage and you know the, as far as the 30 grand goes or 50 grand or 70 i know a lot of people charge i know a buddy of mine charges seventy thousand a year you know um we act like that's a lot of money but everybody's got an idiot on their payroll that they're paying more than 30 grand to I promise you, everybody does. Everybody has a dodo on their payroll that they should have fired a long time ago, but he brings the donuts or something and you don't fire them. That would you rather have that dodo licking stamps four hours a day, or would you rather, you know, have access to some of the smartest people in your peers and, you know, really 
really that keep you accountable, keep you on your toes and keep you up to date. Cause we do a call every week along with the meeting. So I, I'm not pitching it. Don't, I don't want this to sound like I'm, Hey, go buy my thing. Um, but it, it's no matter who's, um, no matter what industry you're in, uh, get into a mastermind group if you can. Uh, it, one that you can afford. You know, ours is out of reach for most people because they're they're not because it's they can't afford it because they just don't meet the minimum. Yeah, sales but like rate. you said, like you know, if you're at a one million and you said the average is around seven, you know, for thirty grand a year, all you need is one one little yeah. idea, one thing, and just you just the ROI could be immense on just one thing for that. I, I've heard a hundred times. Man, I got all my value for the year within the first two hours of the first meeting. You know, I've heard that so many times because this Kevin King gets up and talks and says something really smart. And you go, well, that was worth it, right? I got, I learned a thing that I didn't know. And, and like you said, when you're doing, the beauty is the reason we don't take people that aren't doing a lot of money yet, it's hard to ROI. But if you're already doing, let's say you're doing 7 million a year and you get an idea that gives you a 5% bump right? What's 350 grand for an idea? And you, you know, you're in for a year, you're in for 52 calls and four live meetings and intensives and networks and private calls and all kinds of stuff. It's, you know, and I'm not saying for us, just for any mastermind, if you get a good mastermind, you can't lose money. If, if you, if you have a good enough business already that you can ROI. One of the things that you do that's really cool, too, is, uh, like you said, you know, with digital marketer, and I agree with you, you know, you're recording it, turning it into content. You do that now. Well, you'll do a uh, like the, the weird event. Uh, you, you, you straight up say, hey, uh, come out to this thing. You know, there's going to be a hundred of you here, but I'm recording this. I'm going to turn this into a product. You turn, turn it into six products. Yeah, you turn it into six products. You know, and yeah. I, I didn't with my billion dollar seller summit. I didn't used to record those, um, but now that's half the pro. That's where the actual the profit is. It's actually in recording yeah. it, and then selling it to the people that didn't come. But one of the cool things that you do, like at Driven and some of your other events, uh, your AI event, you did this. At, I, I think you do it probably pretty much every one I've ever been to. Is at the end you say get the kick the cameras out of the room, turn everything off, just grab a bottle of wine. You sit up at the stage. You might bring a couple other uh, of your partners or a couple other speakers. And it's just two hours, three hours of just shooting the shit of a Q&A. And the stuff yeah. that comes out of that alone um, pays for the entire event. Yeah, the unplugged. We've, we've been doing unplugged forever because at the end of most events, you know, you still have unanswered questions. And I don't want people to have unanswered questions. But also some people just don't want to talk about, they don't feel comfortable talking about the particulars of their business on camera. So, you know, if they... Because, you know, sometimes a lot of my students are also gurus, right? And you know how gurus are. They don't want to tell you that. Yeah, they want to charge I, for that. They don't want to tell they don't, you. They, they don't, well, they don't want to tell you that they're having a hard time making the lease payment on the Rolls <laughs> Royce. You, know? yeah. yeah. <laughs> you know, they don't want to let you know. Because we all have, you know, because they're afraid it'll hurt their image, right? I talk about all of my screw ups and almost going to jail and going broke and all that. Because, you know. It's real. That's the real of people. But but a lot of the guru guy, well, I can't say that because it would just destroy my image. So I like doing unplug sessions a lot of times because they people feel a little more comfortable talking about their challenges and without feeling like it changes their position. And I think sometimes just, uh, you know, people don't want to ask their question on a microphone in front of a thousand people for fear of embarrassment. What if my question is a dumb question? So when you're just sitting down, slugging back a beer and, you know, chatting, they feel more comfortable asking the questions they probably should be asking. We've, I've, I've done that as a policy for a really long time. We do wicked smart and we do unplugged. And those are the two, you know, we always ask for the best idea in the room. And that, that was a funny story. Wicked smart was invented the first year that Ryan and I did a traffic conversion summit we programmed three days worth of content for a three day event. And at 11 o'clock on the third day, we were out. We didn't have anything else to talk about. <laughs> we, we had actually, we had miscalculated our time and we have anything else to talk about. So we went to lunch and we said, man, we got to fill all afternoon. What are we going to do? And, uh, and I don't know if Ryan or I are together. I think we pretty much together. We came up with the idea 
let's just challenge people to come up and tell us the smartest thing they've learned in the last six months and how it affected their business. And let's give whoever gives the best idea, um, we'll give them a prize. And the rules were you had to have done it. So you started off by saying, hey, I got this result by doing this and here's how you can do it. Right. And that became and uh, and I think the first person that came up, uh, Ryan or I won. Jeff Mulligan's a good friend of ours and he's from um, is a former Boston Knight lives in New Hampshire. And he always says wicked smart. That's wicked smart, you know, and and the first person came up and they did their thing. and was, like, oh, that's wicked smart. And that's stuck. And that's how Wicked Smart got started. But we never did Unplugged. I used to do Unplugged with Andy Jenkins at StomperNet years ago. When I would, I used to go speak for them every now and then. And one of the things that I did was really, really cool was called Unplugged. And we just, Andy and I would sit down on the edge of the stage. Andy was brilliant. I don't know if you ever knew him or not. He was absolutely a really, really brilliant guy. And uh, he and I would sit on the edge of the stage and talk to people for hours. You know, it was a lot of fun. So I kind of picked that up from Andy. Yeah, I do that at the Billion Dollar Seller Summit. I do a hat contest. So the last day, the la- uh, well, well, I do two things. I incentivize the speakers to bring it. So I put a cash prize on the speakers. So because I don't want them doing the same presentation they just did at three other conferences. or the same thing they talked about on podcasts. I want them to bring their, their A game. And sure. so I put a $5,000 cash prize on the first and 2500 on second. And it's voted on the last day. I'm, I'm ineligible. I always speak last. I'm, so I'm ineligible. But all the other speakers that I invite, uh, the, after the last one spoke, everybody votes uh, on who they thought was the best speaker, delivered the best value, and then that person mm-hmm. gets five grand. So it's become like an honor um, to do that. And then as a result, everybody is bringing next level stuff that they normally wouldn't talk about. Because they, and then I publish the list. Of the, and you know, if there's 15 speakers, I, I, publish, I start at number 10. I don't show number 11 through 15. I don't want to embarrass somebody totally. But I start at number 10 and go backwards and announce them up like it's, you know, like it's a billboard top 100 or something, Casey Kasem or whatever. And it works really, really well because everybody's, if you're not in that top 10 of a speaker, you're like, you know, you didn't do so well. You didn't resonate. Uh, right. And then you're not coming back. Uh, if you need the spelling of my name for the check. Uh, <laughs> That's cool. So one of the things that you've been big into lately, uh, well, actually before let's back up one, just to, before we talk about AI, your first AI, you did an AI, you've been involved in AI for like seven years before it was the cool thing to do. I think and- probably six, yeah, probably six years. I, I got, uh, I spoke on AI at the largest TNC, that one before COVID. I spoke on it the year before, and um, I guess that was 20, 2018, I think. And uh, I spoke on AI and showed Jarvis and, um, um, well said labs and a bunch of those before anybody ever knew anything. And, and everybody in the room was just blown away by it. And I feel certain they didn't do anything at all when the talk was done, you know, but I was using it for copywriting and we were building services, um, for it. And like this AI bot that we're, we're, it'll be after this airs, but, but this AI bot, um, you know, we're really concentrating more on the business models that you can apply AI to. So the first AI bot summit was all about opening people's minds up to it. So they understood what it was, understanding how to use the tools and really just grasping this one thought of if you had 10,000 really smart people willing to work for you 24 hours a day for free, what would you have them do? That's always my question because with AI and a little bit of robotics, that's what you have. You have, an unlimited amount of, um, you know, robotic slaves to do your bidding, right? Whatever you want. And they don't take breaks and they don't break up with their boyfriend and they don't sue you for, you know, workplace compliance issues and all that stuff. And, and you're going to see, I think, um, it's already happening. It's just people aren't exposed to it in mainstream yet, but, um, corporate is projecting like huge profits, uh, over the next few years, as they uh, diminish the amount of workers, physical workers, they have not replaced them with AI. <clears throat> uh, Elon Musk, whether you like him or not, you know, cut the workforce at Twitter by 90 percent. And um, and arguably. Um, 
the experience for the end user hasn't changed. Yep. Yeah. It, it's, right. it's your event back in, just to tell a quick little story, and then we'll go into this, but your event back in April, uh, you were showing some business uses. You know, you're talking about the t Army of 10,000. You showed something about, a you know, here's a building, the, the payroll of this building, and use AI, and the payroll goes from, I don't know, some crazy number of a million dollars a month to – Eighty-six dollars a month, or, or what? Some I'm exaggerating. It's like there. a million dollars. I think it was a million and a half dollars. It's the Empire State Building, and the payroll, the daily payroll in the Empire State Building is about. I, if, I'm going to paraphrase. I don't remember the numbers, but it's about a million dollars or more a day, and the average worker outputs seven hundred and fifty words of text a day in white collar America. So, um, if you if you translate that into the cost of open AI to generate that same 750 words, it's about 42 bucks, I think. So it's like, you know, it's, it's in 42, I mean, for all of them, not for one of them, all of them, you know, 42 bucks or 92, but it wasn't much. It was less than, less than $200, I think, to generate the same amount of work product. One of the things that you talked about there were newsletters and like how AI can automate a lot of newsletters. And, and I'm going to, I'm going to disagree with you a little bit there on where you can actually have, I think at that time you may have changed your tune now. I'm not sure, but you're like, let AI do all the writing, do everything. You can just put these things on autopilot. And I think that's definitely possible, but the quality sucks uh, for, in the, for the most part, um, unless you're just assembling links. But if you, uh, but but what you said there actually about newsletters got me thinking. It's back on that same thing we we're talking about earlier, bringing this all together here is where about going to events. It's like, you know what? I used to run a newsletter in the late 90s and early 2000s so we that had 250,000 daily subscribers. We crushed it as using that as a lead magnet to sell memberships, to sell physical products, to sell everything. What if, you know, in, in this Amazon product space, everybody's always trying to build audiences. And they're always like, go build a Facebook group, go create a blog post. And you, as you know, the most valuable asset in any business is your customer list, your email list, your customer list, and be able to use that when you want, as you please. And you can't do that on social media. You have no control over the algorithms on Facebook, right. you know, have no control over how many people see your LinkedIn post or, um, or anything, but with an email list or a customer ba database, you do. And I was like, wait a second, what if we took newsletters and did this with physical products and actually to build audiences? So if, I've, I'm, if I'm selling a dog products and I happen to have sustainable dog products, I'm like, what if I build an audience, a dog, the dog market's half of America. That's too big. Well, if I niche that down to people who are into dogs and sustainability, create a newsletter for them. I'm not trying to sell them anything. This is not a promotional email from my company saying, hey, look at our latest product. Here's our new things. But it's more of a about the dogs. It's about dog training, dog tips, food tips, whatever. And then occasionally you sprinkle in some affiliate links to test things or you maybe even get a sponsorship. So make this thing self-sustaining. And then when you're ready to launch a product, you have an avid, rabid, loyal fan base to launch that product to. I was like, this is the way to actually build things. So we, I started looking into it, devoured everything you you showed about newsletters. You even set up a special tele, I think it was Telegram newsletter channel. I devoured everything in there. I went out, devoured everything in the newsletter space for three months, like everything. I was like, I already know this stuff, but I want to re-educate myself on the latest tools, the latest strategies. And I just launched one uh, in August, August fourteenth, uh, for the Amazon space. So that, I already have an audience there. Let me figure this out. Let me like figure out what are the best tools, the best systems. And then I can spread this to across multiple industries, multiple things. And <clears throat> that's what we're doing now. And it, it's hugely successful so far. And, and AI is a part of that, but I'm not letting AI write it. AI is more of the, the creative side. It's help, it, it will rewrite something. If I'm trying to think of a headline, I'm like, what's a better way to say X, Y, Z? I'll type in what's a better way you know, to say, what are 10 ways that, that are funny and catchy in the tone of Perry Belcher or whatever it may be to say this? You know, give me all these cool ideas and then I mix and match or sometimes it, it nails it or I'll write a, I do a six, you, you talked about this in one of your things, the six second video. And so the beginning of every one of my newsletters is a six second story. It's a personal story about me. It's something about me meeting Michael Jordan, spending a night with him in a, in a suite in Atlantic City the day before, the night before he first retired. Um, and, you know, it's crazy stories or about my divorce or about, you know, seeing a naked girl on the balcony. Uh, you know, it's, it's edgy, crazy story, but then I tie that back into the physical products and I'll use AI sometimes maybe to help tweak that. Or if we got a, some scientific document from Amazon about how the algorithm works, I'll use it to read the document, summarize it, and then, you know, rewrite it with a human touch and add personality to it. So that's where using AI in other industries, I, I think is, is brilliant. Most people aren't getting that. 
uh, right now. Most people just think of it as this is a threat <clears throat> to my job. This is a threat to this is the Terminators coming to kill me, yeah. take over the world. So what about everything's a conspiracy theory? Yeah, yeah. I mean, AI, I was just had just had a chat in, in August. It's my father's 82nd birthday. And I was sitting there for an hour explaining AI to you know, an 82 year old and a 79 year old. And their mind was just they just was blown. They're like, how do you know all this? This is this is like science fiction movies or something. And I'm like, this is what you can do with it. And most people don't understand that. So what would what are your thoughts on on AI right now and how people are misunderstanding or misusing it and what are the best opportunities out there? Well, um, circling back to your newsletter thing that the AI sucks for newsletters, it depends on the kind of newsletter you're writing. Yeah, that's right? what I said. If it's a link if newsletter or something, you can do it. Yeah, if, you're, if it's a if it's an aggregated or what you call a link newsletter, what I call a curated newsletter, uh, the AI does a really good job at writing basically a, a tweet and then linking to the article. And you do that like eight or nine times and you got a, a newsletter. But did you see the and one, I, the hustle? I think it's they did a study like people are saying that. I don't know if you saw this from the hustle, but the hustle actually hired a guy. He went out and he did like, let me see if I can fully automate a newsletter, hundred percent AI. So they had their programmers do some stuff and they put it out. It was about the nineties. So they would take today, you know, if today is a, uh, you know, April 6th, two, uh, or no, August 6th, 2023, they would do August 6th, 1993. What happened on that day? You know, Jurassic Park, the hot movie. That, yeah. But the thing is, it was repeating itself. The way it was writing was like all it was just. You got to have you got to have humans that do a final review. Yeah. I mean, you got to have a human still do a final review. Yeah. yeah. We've got a system. So Chad, my partner, Chad, built a software system. We're about to launch. Actually, it's called Letterman. And it um, we manage 18 newsletters a day through it. And we do it with three outsourcers. And the way that yeah, the way that we do it is. uh uh, we handpick what we're going to talk about. So basically, uh, we have a bunch of API feeds that tell us these are the stories that are trending about this subject today. And then our guys can go in and just hit click, click, yes, 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 no, yes, yes, no, delay, delay, delay. So maybe for a future issue. And then it's going to pull together those links and drop them into our software. And then the software <clears throat> reads a... Um, reads the article and then writes a uh, like a tweet that tells them to go th that compels them to go read this article. The call to action is compelling them to read the article. Right. So, so, then so it's really, SEO then it's not really, it's a, or is it a newsletter? It's a newsletter. So this all goes into a newsletter and basically like, for instance, financial is a great example. The capitalist is ours and we want them to be able to, get the gist of like the wall street journal and three thumb swipes. And even though we're only writing, there might be 10 links in here, right? Um, we're writing like 140 characters on each link, compelling you to go click the link and AI is writing that. Right. And then they're going over and reading the actual article on the original source. Right. So, so it's, an expanded, we're just, it's an expanded drudge report or something. It's exactly what it is. It's not, it's not even kind of like it. It's exactly what it is. Now the opposite, that's only really useful if you have a news worthy topic. Yeah. News or financial or something yeah. that's hard. Yeah. Entertainment, uh, financial entertainment, sports, politics, things that change every single day. But if you're in the Amazon space, you got to think about it more like a, a magazine. Yeah. So, what we'll do there is uh, find a feature article or three feature articles is even better. So we'll, let's say for instance, my things on Amazon and I'm talking about optimizing the perfect Amazon listing, right? I don't know, whatever, but I'd go find three, the three best articles I could possibly find on that subject anywhere in the world, feed them into the AI, have them read all three and then write me a new article. And oftentimes the way we keep it interesting, we have characters, um, uh, ghost writers created that write in the style of whomever, right? So, but I mean, really detailed, like uh, we, we don't want to duplicate somebody, but like, for instance, my gardening expert, right? So her name is Susan Wilson. She's from Atlanta, Georgia. She's a 55 year old Christian conservative woman's been gardening for 30 years, grew up on a farm with her grandmother in rural Alabama and learned to live off the land. And her husband, Fred and her do this or that. It's all, it's all created 
by the AI, but her writing her, she learned to write and speak in the style of uh, Paula Dean and Louis Grizzard, who Louis Grizzard was a famous columnist, a humorist, almost like a Mark Twain. And, uh, but watched a lot of Martha Stewart videos growing up with her grandmother, right? So that was her style. So now you've invented this character that is Susan Wilson, that you're delivering content that's trending right now. So you know the content's popular, right? And you're delivering it from an amalgamation of the best deliverers in the industry. So like in my in financial, right? We're, we're delivering in the style of Ray Dalio, Charlie Munger, uh, and uh, um, um, Jim Cramer, right? So, and we'll, we'll deliver in those styles, but we don't really tell it to write it in any one style. We incorporate those different styles together and create our own amalgamation. But that has to pass a human review before it goes out. All of it does. Everything passes a human review. In the, U- in the Philippines first, and then there's a human review editor in the U.S. that does a final, final human review. Yeah, that'll work. And they're, that, that, that and they're giving, yeah. yeah, they're giving feedback back and forth. So eventually the Filipino editors catch 99%, right? Unless it's just something cultural that they don't understand. And then the U.S. people can catch the rest. And you know what? Occasionally you make a mistake. And you know what? So what? It's a newsletter. I mean, it's like it, they, you know, it, it's a free newsletter. But one of the things that we found, Kevin, that's killing right now that you might find is our email list. I'm I'm on a mission to get my email list to never send a promotion ever. Mm-hmm. That's what I'm and on. Way, I'm on too. Yeah. So the way I do it is by sending out content. So like Perry might send. You're out doing it every day right now. You, I get an email from you every day on copywriting. Big on, long email, right? Yeah, big long. I save them. They're they're valuable. I mean, some of them, some of them go into my swap file. Uh, but and it, you, it's a I subtle, it's a subtle, like you're staying top of mind. You're doing it. Dan Kennedy does it um, mm-hmm. right now. And there's a couple of others. Oh, he's doing that with, uh, with Russell. Um, but uh, I, and they're valuable. Yeah. You and know, um, th- you could just read that and never do another thing, but it's, you're staying top of mind and then you'll put in something. Oh, PS, remember the AI summit's coming or, or, or whatever. And I, that, that stuff works. It well, what's about to happen with those lists, and we're doing another list right now, is once you open that thing about headline writing, right, um, I can fire off a straight-up promotion to you. Yeah, you're segmenting based on what I click and what I do open and read. In- instantly. Yeah. So you, you're opening reading my article, right? So you just read my article about headlines, and then, the, then you close that article down. You close that email the next email in your queue is from me going, Hey, a fibs copywriting course is 50% off today. Great deal. And you're already so pre-framed to that. The open, the open rate on that second email is like 70 to 80%. Yeah. Yeah. We're doing that. We're going to do that in the product space where we're going to watch what people click. And if they're always clicking on the, the docs and story, we'll start feeding them more docs. And there's a lot of really cool tools. I mean, I have a, 77 page document of newsletter stuff of tools and yeah. things that I've built. Um, uh, and you know, I, I devour about two hours of newsletters a day myself across multiple things, just looking for ideas. Uh, and, and you know, your, your emails come in. I, I usually read them at night, you know, I'll batch them up during the day. I'm not going to, uh, uh, and I, and I sit down for two hours every night, you know, with a, with a drink and, uh, some good music on. I just, I just go through them and I take notes or send stuff into my swap file or like you just did one recently. 10 copywriting uh, bullet points or something like that. Uh, yeah, and, you know, I was like, okay, that I, I cut and paste those 10 into my, you know, most of my new, but it's a good reminder. Um, and I, I paste those into my, uh, you know, swap file or my, I call it file. forced. Blog. I call it forced blogging. Yeah, it is. You're, you're bringing, you're going, it's personal. You're going to them. I'm not having to come to you. It's a big difference. You know, the Even other if thing it's with in that. your inbox for a while, it's still there. Cause it's like, shit, I got to get to that versus a blog. Yeah. I just forget about it. It's like I'm writing like, 750 to 1,000 words a day on that. And generally speaking, too, you can take that same content you're putting in your newsletter, and it makes awesome social posts. Yeah, we're doing that. I'm, I just I wasn't yeah. on LinkedIn for a year. I, I had a LinkedIn account, and I think I'd logged in once in the last three years. I'd been on Facebook and was doing a little bit, of, and I just didn't have time. And then I was like, you know what? I'm missing the boat here in this industry. I need to be on LinkedIn. So just a few weeks ago, I hired someone for 1500 bucks a month. 
that has a lot of LinkedIn experience, just you just manage this. You go write the stuff. I'll uh, prove it. Uh, you know, and you you go do all the all everything you got to do. And then I'm now taking stuff from my newsletter. So here, take this that we just wrote about the algorithm. This is sure. the great content for LinkedIn or for Twitter. Let's I'm, I'm working on Twitter yeah. now. Let's put this out there. That'll be good lead magnets and good content. To, to bring more people into the ecosystem. And so that whole, you get that whole flywheel, but it's, we're talking about it for newsletters uh, f- for, you know, Amazon sellers, but you can do this for physical products. You can do this for any industry and then leverage off of that. You see that they're always by clicking on the docs and ads. Then you start driving them to your print on demand docs and t-shirts, or you start driving them to Amazon to buy yeah. docs and uh, bowls or, or, or whatever. Guy that sells, it's if there's a guy that sells drones on Amazon, you should have a drone newsletter. You know, you absolutely should have a drone newsletter. And when I should, we say when when Perry and I are talking about newsletters, there's a big misconception in my mind. Uh, maybe you have a little bit different take on it, but so mm-hmm. many people have what they call a newsletter. You go to their website, you know, the drone maker, sign up for our newsletter. And the newsletter is nothing but a promotional email. It's like, hey, we just announced two new parts. We just announced this. To me, that's not a newsletter. That's a promotion. And you're not going to get email. deliverability on it either. Yeah. I mean, a newsletter provides value. It's like 95% value, 5% promotional. And it's value. It's something you want to get it to where people look forward to getting it. Not, oh, God dang, I just got another freaking email from Drones or Us. Delete, delete, yeah. delete. Uh, they yeah. like, I got to open this because right. it may have some cool tactic in there on how to fly my drone, you know, or, or in heavy winds or, or whatever, whatever it may sure. be. Um, that's what you got to be thinking when, when you're doing this. And AI is, is a great tool. And I always remember something you said when, uh, just as a quick aside here, it's a quote I often quote requote you on this and credit to you but you always said you know, when it comes to selling products people on, on amazon people don't buy products on amazon they buy photos uh, absolutely and so can you talk about the, just for the amazon people here nobody can buy a picture nobody can buy anything on the internet it's impossible all you can do is buy a picture of something that's or or if you're writing copy you're creating a mental picture of a thing right so yeah um i'm, I'm a big believer in um product photography being a giant piece of what you do and making something that's demonstrable. If you can actually show how it works in a 30 second video clip, I think that's different than anything, you know, that, that works more powerfully than anything because you've got to, and design, I think you're, you're seeing now is becoming more and more important, the quality of your design, because we don't have any way to trust companies right? You don't really have a way. It used to be the old Dan Kennedy world. And, and Dan at the time was right. You know, ugly sells and pretty doesn't, right? The truth is today, pretty outsells ugly. And that's just, we've proved it eight times, eight times over. Uh, pretty outsell, outsells ugly. And especially if you're selling a physical good, right? So don't skimp on the amount of money you spend on photography and photo editing and all those things. I was in, uh, uh, was in Kevin, interesting thing. I was in, uh, uh, um, Guangzhou, China, and I went to this illustration company. They they do illustrations. You know, have you been to uh, you've been to Ewu before? Okay, so you know upstairs in Ewu, like on the fourth and fifth floor, it's all service companies, web companies, stuff like that. And I found a company up there, and they were doing watches. So they would take a watch. You can't take a good enough photograph of a watch for that photograph to actually work in a magazine. It's an impossibility. So what they do is they take a picture of the watch and they pull it into an illustration computer. And then there's a program just for jewelry that has all of these textures and paintbrushes and all that. And they actually build the watch on top of the photo. They build an illustration of the watch. And if you ever pick up a magazine and really look at get a magnifying glass and look at the picture of the Rolex on the back, right? You can see where there's an illustration piece cut here or there. You don't see any of the photo. They completely overlay it. But sometimes it takes these guys two weeks to sit on Illustrator and replace every little pixel dot. Everything is a a vector. And then they send that off and that becomes... Yeah, I don't know how much I would trust it to do that, but I, but yeah, it, it probably can. It can certainly enhance the photos a lot. You, you're seeing like AI AI photo enhancement become a really big deal. Have you seen that thing that takes? Um, I mentioned it at uh, AI Bot Summit. I'm trying to think of the name of it now. Topaz. 
so past that, yeah. Well, you can take your old video footage and it'll turn it into 4K footage. It looks pretty doggone good. I mean, you take an old piece of footage that you shot 10 years ago and you run it through there and it'll give it a, a whole facelift and make it really appear to be uh, 4K footage. Yeah, as Remini uh, does that for photos, you can have some old photo or even something yeah. you, you downloaded, uh, you know, some stock image you downloaded online. It's kind of low res because they want you to go pay for the high res. Just download the low res, sure. run it through Remini, and it'll upscale it. And uh, yeah. upscale.io is another one. There's a bunch of them. And some yeah, of them like, yeah, they're coming cow, along, man. this is amazing stuff. Yeah, another year from now, um, you know, probably most of the things that we're using services for now will be, you know, you don't have to. We're, we're making a lot of money right now in the Philippines by our outsource company uses AI to do things for people. So, you know, if you wanted an illustration of a product or whatever, you could send it to me and we're going to charge X for that. But we're actually going to use tools that cut our labor time down by 80, 90 percent. You know, we, we haven't got it to where we can cut it all the way out yet. And we still hire art directors, you know, really, but it, it allows you to, instead of hiring 30 B minus designers and, you know, an art director, you use AI and you get three, three or three or so, three or four really high level art directors. And you don't need all the, <clears throat> the, the carpenters anymore. Right. So the, the, the if you've seen the how the way they're building houses now with the brick laying machines and all that, all the all the carpenters, all the framers, <clears throat> that won't be a profession in another twenty four months. Well, that's the scare I think that the general public has when it comes to AI. Is like, well, it's going to take my job, and so I don't want that. But look what happened in the industrial revolution. Look what happened when the wheel was invented. People will adapt, <clears throat> and, and and if you don't adapt, you're going to get left behind. <clears throat> and I think right now. One of the biggest skills, if you're listening to this and you're, you know, in high school or college or you're young and still trying to figure, you need to learn how to do prompting. Um, prompting, I think, good prompting versus okay prompting can make a world of difference with AI. And as this gets more and more sophisticated, being good at prompting is going to be a major skill set that's high in demand. Would you agree with that? I think so. Um, it's funny, though, <clears throat> you know, now you can go to, um, open AI and say, write me a mid journey prompt of this and use this camera lens and this, but you got to you know, know what whatever. the camera lens, that's where photographers yeah, are, but, but you, really, or you, you, you kind of don't, you can actually have uh, open AI, write the mid journey prompt for you. It's crazy. And a lot of people are doing that. And I think that's, I think prompting is going to become easier and easier, but it's still going to require imagination. You know, that no, no artificial intelligence engine is ever going to be able to replace imagination. You know, it's not going to happen. So I think that we're, we're, we're fine for, you know, a good long while. I don't see it being a problem, but there's good money to be made right now with just arbitrage. You know how it is, Kevin, you've been around this business long enough. When anytime a market is inefficient, that's when all the money's made. Right. And right now <clears throat> you got people who need things done. Nobody wants to work. Right. <laughs> so, you know, AI is just filling the slot perfectly. So we can offer services now that used to be, you know, like we'll do unlimited video editing for $2,000 a month. Right. Well, we're doing 90% of that video editing with AI. If we were doing it by hand, we'd have to charge $10,000 a month. Right. And the end of the day, the customer doesn't care. The customer's getting the desired product delivered within the timeline. They don't really care if you did it yourself or if a robot did it. And if they do care, well, it's probably not your kind of customer, right? So all the stuff that you guys go through of writing product descriptions and and uh, all your your SEO, your keyword loading, and your, your product uh, um, uh, photo enhancement and all the stuff that you do, I'd say in, within a year... Uh, Probably right now, if you're studious, you can do 90% of yeah, it. Yeah, you can. But I mean, within it's, a year. It's been a big thing. I, mean, I, I just was in, I'm in another mastermind with a big Chinese seller. He does $50 million a year or something. He's based in China and sells into, into the U.S. And he said that AI has been a leveling ground for the Chinese sellers. Yeah. Right? Because oh, now sure. they used to, you know, you'd have all that um, um, you know, broken English and stuff on listings or they couldn't understand the, the culture to write it in the right way. And he said with AI, that advantage is gone. 
uh, for, for Westerners. So you gotta, you gotta step up your game and, and, and now it's in still, you have an advantage in branding or innovation or, or some other, other areas, but, uh, it's leveling the playing field for a lot of people. Yeah. We found it. We found with mid journey, uh, <clears throat> packaging design has been packaging design mockups have been amazing. We've come up with some really great packaging ideas that we wouldn't have come up with. Um, and for the most part, you can send those over to your factories in China and get a, a reasonable well, people doing that for product. Now they'll come up with a product idea. Like, Hey, I want to make a, uh, I don't know, a new dog bowl. They'll have the AI create, you know, they'll, they'll give it some parameters. It needs to be this. It needs to be slow the dog down from eating or not slip on the floor or whatever. Right. Uh, and, have the AI create a hundred different models of it. Just boom, boom, boom. Use 3d illustrations, put that into a tool like PicFu, let people vote on it. Uh, and then, you know, have the top couple, you know, go to uh, molding and make prototypes and then do some additional yeah. testing. You couldn't do that. That's it's just what you can do now is just, is sometimes, sometimes almost mind boggling. At- and, and, you know, robotics have really taken down molding costs. You know, back when you and I started, you know, well, I want a custom mold for this. Well, it'll be a hundred thousand dollars. Now, it's, you know, six grand, you know, <laughs> you know, whatever less, you know, depending on what you're molding, but it's crazy how cheap molding costs have gotten. So I, we're, <clears throat> we're almost out of time here. Actually, we've gone over, but just real quick before we wrap up, what are, what would you say are three things out there that you're seeing right now that are either hot opportunities that people need to be paying attention to or three big, mis- or maybe even three big mistakes that, people are making when it comes to trying to sell physical products to people? Um, okay. Um, well, b- big opportunity and big mistake is trying to sell all your products on a Shopify store rather than, a, uh, in, you know, if you're outside Amazon, going outside the Amazon world for a minute, we can't get anything to convert on Shopify as well as we can get it to convert in a funnel. Uh, on a straight up landing page with an upsell, we make way more money. Um, I've tried it every which way from, from a Sunday. So I think from a physical standpoint, building single item product funnels is something most people don't do. They send people to store a storefront. Here's multiple offer. Here's multiple. Yeah. We've not, we've not done well with that. We've not even done well selling a single item on a Shopify store. We always with any other go high level click funnels, any of them could just kick the snot out of Shopify for a single item stuff. Shopify is great for a multi item, put it in your cart and check out experience, but not for what we do. Uh, that that's a, I think that right now, uh, AI presents the, the greatest opportunity in maybe ever. Um, so I said before, it may be bigger than the advent of the internet. I think it might actually be, that probably sounds crazy to most people. But because the, the internet's just a communications device, right? This is actually hacking intelligence, which is a whole different animal. Um, and with quantum computing coming online, it's only going to become much more powerful because quantum is what's slowed down AI to this point. It's the only reason that all Teslas aren't autonomous right now. They couldn't all be autonomous. There's not enough computer power. Um, but but uh, um, I, I think that, you know, the big opportunities I'm, that I just, I talk about all the time with my people. Number one is, um, you know, create a service that you can provide with the aid of AI so that you can get your economies of scale. My outsource services, I used to make 15% margin on all my outsourcers. I got 325 outsourcers. I'd make about a 15% margin. Now that they're all AI enabled, they put out two to three times as much work product for the client. So the client loves it. And, uh, and we're making 30 and 40% margins. So I think that everybody needs something done, done for you. Services are really, really, really easy to sell. So, you know, create an online, create some sort of a done for you service that you can get economies of scale with AI, do that. Number two, um, I think product design, both in print on demand and just general product design, uh, you know, everybody's a designer now, you know, with, with a mid journey or with a, a stable diffusion or whatever, everyone's a designer. Uh, third is a uh, um, rapid software development. You know, you can do so much software development with AI now um, that the, the time and investment to create a software application have, has probably been reduced by at least 80%, 80%. 
80 to 90 percent the challenge i'm fortunate i have a business partner who's a software architect right the challenge with software is the architecture you still you still have to architect the software um in other words draw a great plan of what you want to accomplish but the coding part can largely be done uh with ai probably I think they, I read a thing the other day that 70% of all code written in the world right now is being written with AI. Yeah. I just did something with bubble, uh, just recently, yeah. uh, just yeah. no time Bubble's amazing. to do yeah, some co- really cool stuff on bubble. Yeah. And then, um, and then finally, uh, publishing, you know, book publishing, audio publishing, uh, newsletter publishing, any kind of publishing, um, it won't be replaced. We're not going to be reading AI generated books on Amazon. Those are going to be flat as a biscuit, but, like a lot of times I write now I'll write something and I'll say, Hey, rewrite this in the style of Perry Belcher. And it actually characterizes it. It, it, it makes a caricature out of me, right? It, it exaggerates a bit my hokiness and my Kentucky country boy, simple thing. And some of it's over the top, some of it I like, but it, it gives me, um, it's like having a writing partner, someone to bounce stuff off of the wall. Yeah, and, and then I, I can do that with that six second story. I just did one recently, and I wrote it myself, and then I put the whole thing into AI, and I said, I forget what I told the prompt, but write this a little bit funnier, or write this and this and this, and it spit it back out. And some of the lines it came up with were way better way to say yeah. what I said. It said the same thing, mm-hmm. but it's like it, it humorizes like that's freaking brilliant. So I I you know used some of it and didn't use the rest, but that's like that's like. Awesome that you have a way to yeah. do that. You don't got to show it to your buddy. And what do you think? He's like, ah, oh, you know, if you said this in a different way or sit there and rack your brain, it's, you know, it's what a lot of people don't do. I'll write copy sometimes and I'll finish a piece of copy and I'll drop it in. I'll say, uh, pretend to be world class copywriter, uh, um, uh, Dan S. Kennedy and critique this piece of copy. Or be, be Gary Halbert and critique. And then it'll give me like, give me a 10 point critique. So it'll say, okay, number one, you should do this. Number two, you should do this. Number three. And then I can go in and just say, okay, take suggestions number two, four, seven, nine, and 10. And from, from Mr. Kennedy and rewrite the sales letter. You know, that's a good idea. Like if you're trying to sell products, I just brainstorming here. Maybe you're doing this, but if you're if you're trying to create a video script or try to create one of these you know landing pages for a single product, you could write something and tell it to write it in the, the style of Gunthy Ranker, the infomercial writer, right. or write it in the style of uh, what's the guy that uh, that died, uh, that big um, blue shirt all the time, uh, uh, really famous uh, infomercial host. Um, oh, Billy Mays. Billy Mays, or, or uh, I've got Billy Mays formula or, locked down. Or, or I've already got someone like that, but you could have the yeah. AI rewrite the whole thing. Yeah. Yeah, it's great, and it and it and it really does do a. I like the idea of asking it to critique it. That's a good one too. Or I'll even pull out just the bullet point section and say, "Okay, take these bullet points and pretend to be world class copywriter Gary Bensavinga, who's famous for being the best bullets writer in the world." And then Gary will. Uh, I matter of fact, I think the newsletter you got on bullet points was written. <laughs> by Gary Bensavinga. So I ask it says as Gary Bensavinga, world-class copywriter, Gary Bensavinga, what are your 10 biggest tips for writing killer bullet points? And I think that's what that. Yeah, uh, keep email that. I mean, he obviously is a good one. Cause I kept, I put in the swap pile. Yeah. That's he's a good, you know, he, and he was the best bullet point copywriter who ever lived. He's still, he's still alive. Not was, but I think i I say was on most of these copywriters. Cause I'm, I'm eventually going to be the number one copywriter in the world. Cause everybody else is going to be dead. You know, they're all, all my, all my contemporaries, Dan's died twice now. So, you know, uh, but you know, he came back to life, but, but yeah, a lot of my friends, uh, uh, Clayton Makepeace, a great copywriter passed the last year and, and a year and a half ago, I guess. And, uh, um, you know, I never got to meet Gary Halbert, unfortunately, and some of my biggest copywriting heroes I never got to meet, but it's great. Cause I can call them in and ask them to critique my stuff now. And they give me a full critique of it. And I'm like, oh, that's right. I forgot Gary always did blank, you know, to remind me or, you know, look at this headline and rewrite this headline. Give me 10 headlines in the style of Gary Halbert to replace this headline. And there's almost always one of them that just smokes whatever I've done. 
I mean, I just right. did it with an Amazon. There was a, a, a month ago or so. There's an Amazon science document about the algorithm on 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 Amazon, talking about how they're going to use AI and all this stuff. And it's a lot of techno jargon. Like, according to test 32-3, we did this, and you know, I was like, I don't understand half of this. I'm not a data scientist, so I just dumped it into AI, but it wouldn't let me because of the token limits and the PDF reader. I couldn't get it to work properly, so I had to dump it in sections. So I had to like copy, you know, part of it. Dump it in, say, summarize this section, then copy to the next section, summarize this section. And I ended up with like seven pieces of it broken up into summaries. And I dumped all seven summaries in and said, now summarize the seven summaries. And it, it actually came back with some really good stuff. Um, Jarvis yeah, has to do it in, really a in a fourth grade level, you know, and it just broke it down. Like anybody yeah. was like, I get it now. Jarvis has a, a two um, uh, really exceptional tools, and it has the content improver tool. You can just drop something in and it writes it better and it's always better. And then they have another tool called uh, explain it to a fourth grader. And it's a great tool. You just drop your thing and say, explain this to a fourth grader. By the way, I'll give you one more tip before we get off here. It's really fun for writing. So I'm always trying to figure out how do I write with AI that doesn't sound like it's written with AI. Um, <clears throat> and I found this really interesting way to do it. Have you been watching any of the reality TV lately of the reaction shows? Yeah, I've seen some. Yeah, this has become yeah. the big deal. Yeah, yeah. So, Bravo so the does, TV Bravo does a lot of those and stuff. The yeah. TV show is filming different couples laying in the bed or laying Night, on the Night Day Fiance does that, right? Watching watching a TV show and then reacting to the yeah. TV show. Yeah, right. That's a show now. Yeah, Night Day Fiance. Night Day Fiance. Of people reacting to a show. It's the craziest crap I've ever seen. Uh, because Twitch does it with video gaming and with poker games and all sorts of things. Anywho, the other day, I, I own a, a gun publication. And the other day, my guys all want just the most fiery, yes, you should be able to take guns to kindergarten. You know, they want, you know, guns everywhere. Right? And uh, so I was trying to find these gun control articles that, that my guys would want to read. And I had no luck. I wasn't fine. Everything that was coming out was more. Um, you know, people support gun, more strict gun laws, things like that. No, things my guys are never going to want to hear. So I took those articles and I dropped them into uh, OpenAI and said, in the voice of uh, Steve Bannon, write a fiery rant uh, response to this article from CNN. My God, they're so good. I mean, they're like, just like, I can't believe what the commie libtards at CNN are trying to push today. It sounds like Rush Limbaugh wrote it, right? Just fantastic. And uh, uh, so I do a lot of that now. I, I don't write. And that way there's no plagiarism issue at all. You're you're writing a reaction to a thing, right? So it it, it changes the whole, uh, the whole dynamic, right? That's awesome. Well, Perry, I really appreciate that. I know you're a busy man. I really appreciate your time. We've, uh, we could probably sit here and keep talking for the next six hours on, on cool stuff. But if, if people want to follow you or learn more about you or any of your events or just get on your list, uh, what, what's the best way for them to do you that? Know what? I don't really have a good way. <laughs> <laughs> I really don't. You know, follow me on Facebook, I guess. I'm like, I'm the world's worst marketer teaching marketing. <laughs> I, uh, <laughs> I, most of my people that, you know, get on my list, get there from, buying a product or coming to an event or something. I don't, I really want really people that are really into whatever I do on my list. So it's a little harder to get on the list, but uh, if you follow me on social, you see everything that I do and you know, but I'm more active on Facebook than I'm anywhere else. I need to be more active other places, but we'll see. Well, Perry, I really appreciate the time today, man. It's been awesome. Uh, and uh, look forward to seeing you again uh, sometime at uh, another event. Yeah, and we're going to have fun. We're going to do uh, in uh, next year, sometime next year, we're going to do uh, Growth Hacking Live. So that's going to be kind of a much bigger event, 1,000 to 2,000, maybe even 3,000 people. I want to start building a big event again. So uh, uh, Chad Nicely and I bought growthhacking.com, and we're building a, a community over there, and that's that's a lot of fun. There is a – oh, you know what? There's a Facebook group called Friends of Perry. There you go. Friends, the friends of Perry on Facebook. Perry on Facebook. Look up that group and join the group and you'll understand everything that we're doing. If there's anything that I don't know why you'd be interested in anything I do, but I but if you are, that's where you'd find it. Kevin, you're a gent. Thank you. Appreciate it, man.